Hello, my name is Rob Woods and welcome to episode 51 of the Fundraising Bright Spots podcast. This is the show for fundraisers who want ideas and inspiration to help you raise more money and make a bigger difference for your charity or non-profit, especially during the pandemic. And in today's interview, I'm talking to a wise and experienced fundraiser named Julia Day Trodson, and we're talking all about the approach that she and her colleagues at St John's Ambulance have taken to high value fundraising during the pandemic. This includes fantastic results with companies, major donors and trusts, as well as a hugely successful online fundraising event towards the end of 2020. I thoroughly enjoyed talking to Julia Day about her approach to fundraising during the pandemic, and I hope you do too. Julia Day Trotson, how are you? I'm very good, Rob. How are you? <laughs> I am very well at the end of a long week, at the end of a very long year. Thank you so much for making time for this conversation. Um, how's the end of this year treating you? Um, I think I'm very tired and so is my team, but they've been doing amazing things this year. So I'm really excited to tell you all about it. Yeah. And that was the reason I was so pleased you uh, agreed to the interview. Just before we get into the detail, help me get your job title right. You're at St John's Ambulance and you're the head of several different teams? I'm head of philanthropy partnerships and special events. Um, I've been, I've had the privilege to be there for a, a year um, and um, it's been a really great time. Lots of change and obviously going through a uh, challenging time fundraising, but um, that we've done some brilliant stuff. So delighted <laughs> so so i gather i've been hearing about it um through the grapevine uh, as well as uh, a couple of conversations you and i have had about it just to start off um across this really difficult time with the pandemic i gather you've uh, managed to achieve some fabulous increase in income and there's various tactics by which you've achieved that one of those is a really interesting approach to a virtual event which we'll come on to but just to get us started what have the results for your team been and indeed you know results for the event so uh, we are 30 percent up on our target from last year um, which is amazing given the landscape we're working in at the moment across fundraising um, and we had an event at the end of the year which raised five thousand pounds on the night but around it thirty three thousand towards some of the work that we were talking about so it's been really really pleasing to see these are really brilliant results Julia Day, and i appreciate that uh, you are a charity that works in the area of of human health. So at, at some level, uh, some of what you're about speaks to, to the con many concerns that people have got to do with COVID-19. But still, I know of many other organisations in this space that have really struggled, especially in the, in the high value space. So really well done. I would love to unpack a little what your approach has been, what some of the, the concepts are that you think have helped to achieve these results. And when we were speaking before, you, you mentioned w with strategies changing so much and so many difficulties your organisation is facing, uh, you mentioned the need for a more robust approach to talking to supporters. Um, I think it's more of a human approach, actually. A robust, absolutely. We need to know what we're talking about in terms of our, our staff, our figures, where the money's going. But actually, I think it's just a bit about being open and honest about where the need is. Um, also, across the board, I think um, I've looked at a lot of the projects that we're working on and the different income streams. And I really want to be obviously bringing in income, but I really want to be building those pipelines and having meaningful conversations that go on into next year and beyond and make sure that we're um, really taking people on that journey with us so I think that's the way we've approached it and I think we've also been doing a bit of what we've called rebel fundraising so for example I think particularly in a philanthropy landscape you might assume that a gift might take 18 months to two years to bring in or um something similar but um we've we've actually been much braver about talking and asking in that area um we at least we're having better conversations with new people as well um we've been talking to trusts and foundations um 
in different ways that we haven't before. And in corporate partnerships, we've been really, um, again, trying to hone our sweet spot and try and find really better matching um, partners. And just generally, I think because of the time this period's given us, it's about really understanding our supporters better. So, yeah, I think that's the approach we've taken. We've It's about that human, open, honest conversation to take forward. And uh, that's not, I mean, lots of charities would like to do that, but they don't always manage it in, in practice. Practically speaking with, with your team, um, have you gone about it? Have you have managed to get people ha- having more conversations on, on the phone or, or you know, or... or through some other electronic means and if so what tips do you have for increasing the chances that we'll have those actual conversations we've um really really gone through our pipelines with a fine tooth comb we've um picked up the phone (laughs) we've sent emails we've we also had our first ever emergency appeal for the whole organization across different pieces um and different uh income areas for my area, obviously, it's the more the high value piece. So we were having a bit more, um, uh, I suppose, bespoke conversations around where we need help. Um, and I think that has resulted in some quite amazing um, relationships that have been ongoing. So, for example, we had a corporate partnership uh, or a corporate support that had come through from the appeal um, at $300,000. Um, we then were able to carry on the conversation with them to then take them on to um, talk about other areas of our work that they may not have been um, aware of before. And they're now funding our youth uh, work at £300,000, which is amazing. So, that, again, that was through being open, giving them options to kind of know more about what we do. And, and I think... Um... From early on, you decided because you couldn't invite people to real events and you couldn't sit and have coffee with people, you were determined to to set up regular chances to share the share the stories and the the impact of what your supporters were were doing. I I think those were a series of breakfast events. But what broadly was the idea and how did they work in practice? So I didn't really want to or. We re- as a whole team, we didn't really want to wait till the end of the year to show people's impact of those donations a few months later because you kind of miss the moment. So we put together some impact breakfast events, um, which were for a wide audience of corporate philanthropy, but pretty much everyone who really wanted to know about everything and who'd given to us or who were having we were having conversations with, so they could really understand how important that work was and what impact they've had. Um, we had uh, case studies and people who come and talk to us. Uh, a couple who um, who are NHS uh, workers, who paramedics, who then drive an ambulance for St John in their spare time to really bring that a work to life all sorts of really amazing people doing amazing things in their spare time and volunteering for St John Um, and that was also we had exactly the 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 example I've just given you of the the corporate partner I was really keen to show the the voices across the board so actually I asked um, the for, for that particular corporate partner to speak at one of these breakfasts from their perspective about why they had funded our work specifically um, and that went down amazingly and also it has the ripple effect hopefully that other corporates will want to do the same Um, but more than anything I wanted to highlight how important that relationship is to us and that's the one that's gone on to again we've been able to from that breakfast keep talking to them to get to a point where they're now funding at quite a significant level our youth work so they're really important I think Um, they're not just these events are not just about income generation at an event. It's about building those relationships and showing what amazing things people do with their donations. And obviously some charities, you know, different charities have different levels of resource. So they're going to have to decide how often they can do something like this. But, but for your organization, how regularly do you do those impact breakfasts? 
So that was this concept was something that we came up with because of the the scenario we're in at the moment. But we love them so much, we're taking them into next year. So we're going to be doing them quarterly. Um, and it's going to be part of, hopefully, once we're back to face-to-face, we will continue to do virtual plus face-to-face events because we are a UK-wide charity. We don't always get to hear from everyone who does work or volunteers for us. So actually virtually the silver lining is that we get to have more voices and we want to carry that on yeah and uh, one thing I love about that is just the notion that it's a series of things and it's already been a series this this year rather than a, a put all our eggs in one basket and it be a one-off that's a key thing I've noticed that uh, some other successful fundraisers have done as well and the other thing I, I'm reminded of, Julia Day, when when you and I had a chat recently, you mentioned that one of your responsibilities is that you're chair of trustees for another charity called Include, and they had an interesting example for how they've helped people feel connected and included in this year when many of us have been feeling isolated. Yeah, so Include, um, I am chair of trustees for this wonderful charity um, who are a, a choir and so this has been quite tricky obviously for people who have might have understanding or speaking difficulties during this time a whole nother um level of trying to connect people but they recently took part in the big give christmas challenge and i really loved the content that was coming out from um that campaign that they put together they had some amazing bits of footage um and film uh, that was people singing obviously in the choir but all sorts and it included volunteers choir members staff and the general community and the feeling you got that when you um, kind of watch them is that you're already part of their community so that was the beautiful bit of the storytelling of why it was so important to give to them um it really is a family people are connected and they've been doing lots of stuff online and taking their choir online in fact so um that storytelling piece about everybody's perspective really um I think gave the the, a really full picture yeah I I think this year more than ever uh helping us the viewer or the supporter meet our need to feel connected to feel part of something we care about is clearly so crucial and it sounds like Include did that really well and again it's interesting to to note I gather Include is a relatively small organisation I'm guessing that maybe not all of their footage was beautifully slick but they but another theme you were telling me the other day for for your other events in your day job is it doesn't have to be polished and perfect in this day and age of video communication its heart needs to be and intention needs to be in the right place and for that reason, even a, a relatively small organisation without you know, uh, lots of resources or editing budgets or so on can still put together something that really is so enjoyable to watch. Yeah, and I would really echo that. That goes across big charities as well, with all of our budgets being frozen or um, when we're a bit tighter on resource. And you can also repurpose a lot of the content so um for example at the big event that I told you about at the end of year the back to our uh, future event um we had um Trevor so Trevor McDonald interviewing a couple of our volunteers Mary and Luke telling their stories Mary had um been uh, uh was at university and then became a volunteer for St John at just the time that um Covid hit so she was also then volunteering in one of the Nightingale hospitals and telling her story about being with um, people who were not with their families when they're poorly and, you know, being there for them. And Luke, who is our cadet of the year, telling his wonderful story about his journey with St. John. Um, We use some of that content again for a different event. Um, So you can, and that again, you could repurpose into written word or just using audio um and using it on social media so you don't have to have lots and lots of perfect things you can just use it in a slightly different way yeah and and just knowing that um some of the other charities i've been working with we've we found that knowing that there's lots of other ways you can 
reuse bits of a story in those different formats really can help you justify all the time and effort it takes to find great stories in the first place and, and do, do the recording well in in the first place because you know maybe weeks later you can be sending a clip to some major donors or in, in, include a part of a, a story on social media or, or, or to a, in a trust application or something so it really pays you back um, and even even just taking a recording that you get transcribed. Sometimes you can even get get it transcribed for free. There are services that do that. And then turning that recording of a story into a blog, the mindset now of being looking for ways to repurpose can help you communicate those stories to different audiences and to audiences that might ordinarily be accessing your charity's information through different channels. I think that's really true. And I think also internally, lots of teams are super busy and you can't keep going to diff- the same people for um, the same story or, or a different story or have multiple teams going to um, someone who might be able to give content. So it also streamlines how that comms piece works across organisations. Um, obviously, you need to update your content to make sure it's relevant, but I think it really does help across all income streams. And you also have that continuity of, of story across the whole piece. Yeah. And in terms of uh, this this big online event, I mean, lots of the events we've been talking about so far are not primarily about getting money through the event. They're about engagement and inspiration and helping people feel part of something. But this other event, you, you uh, when normally you would have had a gala dinner, this time you chose to do an online event and to tell the stories and give people the opportunity to give on the night. But you were also clear from the start that it was nevertheless also a really important relationship building piece to, to increase engagement, to get more conversations from it. Before we get on to a couple of those bits, I'm curious as to um, what your approach was to selling the idea in, in the first place with your colleagues. I think um, I really wanted to come, we would, we needed a touch point at the end of the year. So um, if we didn't have that, there would have been a gaping hole of um, no, you know, no contact with people. And so it was really important to me that we did this. And the audience was a mixture again of, all of our high value supporters, but also some of our key stakeholders across the organisation. So for me, um, it was really important we did it. And we had conversations internally about whether it was going to be worthwhile, would we um, actually raise enough money from it. But I suppose if you're going to set KPIs against something like this in an unknown world where you've never done it before, I was a little bit cautious, but I think I approached it in three ways. One was obviously around income um, towards the work we do, but it's about meaningful conversations. And that, from my perspective, was being able to um, tell the stories that then are uh, stakeholders or advocates and we're a UK wide organisation but they can then go out and use that content and have really good conversations to help us um, build our networks it also gave um, the stories about everything we've done from, from our history right to what we're doing now um, some of our internal stakeholders didn't even know some of the information that we were able to pull together for this or some of the stories um, so it's about meaningful conversations with our supporters as well as stakeholders. But then also, I think for me, is, is driving the, the traffic to maybe our social, digital or our services for maybe another organisation. So there's, it's a bit of a three prong attack on, the kind of, I suppose, pulling an, an event of that nature together. But for me, it was more about telling all the good stuff and all the efforts that everyone has gone to this year and the impact of those donations as well. Hey, it's Rob and I just want to jump in really quickly just in case you're a corporate fundraiser or a trusts or a major donor fundraiser to let you know that we've just launched new dates for our mastery programs in major gifts and in corporate partnerships fundraising. We found that these in-depth programs which include master classes and individual coaching and access to all of the courses and support in the Brightspot Members Club are proving more helpful than ever to fundraisers during the pandemic. In fact, if you were at our virtual breakfast clubs last year, you may remember one wonderful fundraiser named Leanne, who attended our corporate mastery programme, share how she used things she learned in that programme to raise four large gifts and partnerships, 
totaling more than £90,000 as the pandemic unfolded, which made a huge difference to her small international literacy charity. So if you're curious about how the Corporate Mastery Programme or the Major Gifts Mastery Programme would help you to improve high-value fundraising results, you can find out more by visiting our website, which is brightspotfundraising.co.uk, and then clicking on the Services section to find out more about either the Corporate One or the Major Gifts Mastery Programme. For now, though, back to the interview, as I asked Julia Day to explain how her recent online fundraising event worked. Really, top line, could you describe what to yeah. our future was? So it was a virtual event, online, hour and a half, um, private, invitation only. Um, lots of, so we focused on three areas of work that we need funding for. So lot, bringing that to life through either um, archive images, um, film, interviews that I've mentioned with Sir Trevor MacDonald, um, all sorts to just really bring the whole piece to life. I'm very much the kind of person who, if you see something in black and white or in a proposal, it's not quite the same as hearing it from everybody. So that we really wanted to bring those three pieces um, kind of into colour rather than black and white. So that's the way we approached it. Um, So we did a, a case study, a film, Sim, or maybe three elements to one piece of area of work and then that format again for the next so that's the the way we did it um, and then with an ask at each point and so, so with an, uh, uh, the, there would be those stories and then there would be an ask an opportunity to give and then um, yeah. and, and how would people be invited to, to give so it was through a platform we use give a G. Um, um, we'd also had some previous conversations before and after the event that also garnered some um, donations. So, but predominantly on the night it was Give a G. And and just before we move on, it might be something really obvious, but that sometimes falls by the wayside, or it might be kind of less less obvious. But having been through that, if there's a charity listening and they're considering doing some kind of virtual event that inspires people to want want to give there and then. Any last top tips about making that work? I think it's about how um, how do you want your audience to feel when they come away from that event? So it really is about being quite eloquent, eloquent in that piece around why it's so important to fund it, but making it as human as possible. <laughs> it's a fine balance. <laughs> and And then the next question is, I gather... One reason you were really pleased with the event wasn't just the money on the night, that you had a strong sense that doing it did it lead to more conversations and deeper relationships with people who'd been there. What would be your tips for how the listener might deliberately achieve that through their event? So I would say um, pre-event conversations are really important. Um, we had uh, calls and emails with people to really entice them to attend the event, a bit bit of a teaser about what might be coming up um, and also a little bit about the content. Um, Then obviously on the, at the event um, on the night, we did ask people to um, contact us, keep talking to us. So then we did follow up after the event as well. So we, we, on the morning after we sent out um, emails and had phone calls with attendees and Julia Day as you look back on this event in particular is there anything else that you find interesting about uh, how your organization has approached this and and in relation to weighing up success of an event like this um I think you just need to be aware that it's not always about income on the night um it's about being patient and really having those meaningful interactions with your supporters so often you won't get those results until much later on and it's really difficult to measure at this point (laughs) especially when it's an event about how you're celebrating people's impact into your organization so I think the best thing to do is when you're talking to internal stakeholders maybe is around that um maybe expectation management around the fact that you're going to have to be patient and it will work in the end. Um, And I suspect, 
some of the conversations I would give six months to and hopefully um, we'll be seeing some results but it is at the end of the day giving your supporters the best experience they can of um, you and the best uh, stories you can of how they've made such an important contribution to your work so I think that's the key thing to take away yeah it's the thing to be aiming for first and foremost in the first place and 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 trusting that if we if uh, if we do certain things right then in, in due course the, the the money will follow anyway it will and I think it is that if you can have a really lovely stewardship process throughout the year you've got some really nice touch points some really interesting content some great stories you're teeing yourself up for some really great conversations to take forward yeah and then the more of those great conversations you have sooner or later some people as has been true in your experience some of those people are going to give generously well, well done, Julia Day. A huge congratulations to you and all your colleagues on um, a wonderful set of initiatives this year and wonderful results that have been generated by that effort. And thank you for coming on the podcast to share how you've gone about it. I look forward to catching up with you very soon. But for now, Julia Day, thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Rob. So there you go. I hope you found Julia Day's ideas and examples helpful. If you did, please remember to subscribe to the podcast today so that you don't miss out on any of the other episodes that we've got coming up. For a full transcript and a summary of this episode, go to the blog and podcast section of our website, which is brightspotfundraising.co.uk. And if you'd like some more ideas to help you succeed during the pandemic, then why not download my ebook? It's called Power Through the Pandemic. And it gives seven key strategies to help you raise money, even now through major donors, corporates and trusts. You can download it for free at brightspotfundraising.co.uk forward slash power. And I'd like to say a huge thank you to everyone who's been spreading the word about this show to colleagues and on social media. I really appreciate it. And we'd love to hear what you think about this episode. We're both on LinkedIn and on Twitter. Julia Day is at Julia Day Trodson, which is spelt at capital J U L I D E capital T R O E D S O N Julia Day Trodson, and I am at Woods underscore Rob. Finally, thank you so much for listening today, and I wish you the very best of luck with whatever you're doing today to make a positive difference. <laughs>